Hey, welcome to Freedom Church. Come on. If you are joining us for the very first time, we want to warmly, warmly welcome yeah. you. My name is Praveen. And my name is Shana. We are the campus pastors of Freedom Chennai. And Come it's off. so awesome to be joining you yes. at venues, online, or even at your homes. That's right. If you're here for the very first time, like Praveen said, you yeah. are so welcome. And we're glad you chose to join us this morning. Come on. You can send us an email, chat with us, connect with us, so we know who you are, where you're watching from. Yes, absolutely. And we would love for you to connect yeah. with us online and follow us on social media. On. So you can get to know everything that's happening across yeah. our global movement. All also, you can catch up with our content and information that we keep putting out on our social media yeah, channels. Absolutely. Last week, you heard that the cave is coming. Yes. Cave X, yes, our 10th year of yes, the cave, come on. is uh, a few weeks away. Yep. So let us know in the chat whether you've got your tickets and where you'll be joining us from. That's right. Uh, the cave is our annual gathering. It happens live in the UK, yeah. online and in a lot of our yeah. venues across uh -huh. the world. Guys, it's going to be an amazing, yeah. powerful weekend, which really, I don't yeah. want you to miss out. Yeah. So if you have any questions, if you want to know more about the tickets or how you would like to join or anything else, reach out to your local campus leader or send us an email to us and we would love to give you more information about the cave. Absolutely. But just before the cave, next week we're yes. celebrating something that's one of our favorite yes. times of the year. Come on. It's not just a time where we maybe have yeah. Easter eggs, that's right. but we get to celebrate yeah. all that Jesus has done oh, for us. So good. It's our Easter week so celebration. So good. So good. Love it. This year on Easter Sunday, yeah. we have a special event called Unbelievable. This is all about the story yeah. and the moments of Jesus' yeah, resurrection. Absolutely. It's going to be an amazing event filled with testimonies mm. and, uh, and life and celebration yeah. of what Jesus did on the cross. Yeah. This is also a great opportunity for you and I yes. to be inviting others to this event yes. or maybe have them join here online. Absolutely. So let's be praying and let's be expectant for yes. what God is going to do yes. in us Come and on. in others this Easter mm. Sunday. So good. Right? And now we're going to hand over to the worship band before yeah. we hear a word from Pastor G.
finish it. We're going to continue to declare our God is good. That he shines a light in the darkness and the darkness will not overcome this morning. Our God is a God of promises and we stand true to that. I 
It's hard being human. It can be a roller coaster of satisfaction and struggle, swerving between the meaningful and the mundane, through the climbs of joy and triumph and the steep falls of confusion and pain. But there is hope, right? Hope is beautiful. It says it doesn't always have to be this way. Hope says change will come. It leads people to be motivated to see tomorrow and see it in a new way. But what is hope? Is it just wishful thinking or cheery optimism? Is it just the chance that maybe there is some unauthored possibility the good will come? 
But what is good? And why do we long for it? We respond with deep affection to beauty and music, to mercy, comfort and kindness. These are good things. But we only feel this affection because these things are an experiential whisper of God, our maker in this life. They are a whisper of redemption. That in our ugly circumstances, there is still beauty on a glowing horizon. That in our pain and confusion, we can find comfort in a familiar melody. And when parts of us have been stolen by the world, kindness and mercy still remain to fuel us to carry on. You are a soul longing for God because his fingerprints are on your soul. And in the void between the reality of our brokenness today and what we long for in God's embrace, we need a bridge. We need a bridge built from the hope of redemption. But the truth is that simple wishful thinking is an invisible hope. We cannot cast our lives into a self-dependent assurance. Real soul-altering hope must come from outside of ourselves. It's the one designed in the far-stretching unseen realm outside of our temporary optimism, an eternal hope, a death-defying hope, a hope that can be tangibly felt in the presence of a God who physically proves death was not the end. We can't redeem ourselves. That is a thin vapor of a hope that will be no good to build a bridge from. We need a love beyond our own when we don't know how to love ourselves. But there is a great redeemer, the great bridge builder, Jesus. Maybe you feel like you've lost your innocence or lost the grip of purity crossed a boundary so far that you feel like you're not sure how to get home. Well, you don't have to be punished by the past. Jesus took the punishment to purchase you back. It's the gospel plan. We have been redeemed not by perishable things like silver or gold, but with precious blood. It's the forgiveness flowing red that washes soul snow white. Jesus is the shepherd to guide you onto the bridge of redemption, back to your soul's maker your father. It's not the end. This bridge cannot fall. It is built from the death conquering stones of the highest authority in the universe. And as you cross it, you are invited to throw your baggage and your wrong over the edge into his forgiveness. And when life is over, the former things shall pass away and every tear will be wiped from our eyes. No burden, just joy ecstasy in our true identity, still with a mind, but thinking differently. No more confusion, just vivid clarity. We'll no longer be pilgrims as we arrive at the place prepared for us, the homecoming for all humanity, to be redeemed now and for eternity. That is hope. We want to welcome you to part five of our human series. I mean, this has just been an epic series. You know, when you talk about sex in church, it really does sort of get people's attention. And just hearing about the holiness of sex and how God planned that, it really is incredible. If you missed it, you need to go back and check it out. We've talked about sexuality and about identity and so many powerful subjects. We've talked all about gender. I mean, heck, guys, we've been doing it. The last four weeks, we have been cracking it. I've got the chance today to come and bring the last and final part. And as I was thinking and praying into this, we've sort of journeyed through quite complex um, things that sort of can really cause sometimes, hey, is it this, is it that? But I, I want to come and bring it right back to one thing. And I want to speak to you about hope. Because I just figured, what would God want us to finish on? We can go and touch on some of these subjects. And we said at the beginning, this is a journey for people. This is something that we wanted people to come on the journey to discover truth. And I really believe from the uh, messages we've had from around the world, there has just been testimony after testimony of people finding liberty and freedom because they discovered this truth through Jesus. And so I thought the best way to sort of uh, wind up is really to talk about the hope of the gospel. Because that, that's all we can come back to people. All we can come back to is that the gospel means good news. 
and I want to finish this on good news. <laughs> we may find ourselves in a world where there is so much confusion around identity and sexuality and other things, but do you know what? There is a very clear truth that this one way is Jesus. His name it means truth. Everything about it, he is the truth. And we're going to look today at what this means. We started a week one all, all around the life's big questions. The first, remember the, the first big question? is uh, what, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? What's my purpose and who am I? And I think that, that's what we have. Regardless, who we, we, we want, what am I doing here on planet Earth and what's my purpose? Who am I? What, what is this all about? And God has done, he did an amazing thing in creating us as human beings is that he gave us free will. And the power of free will, it's got like a good side and a bad side. You know what I mean, guys. It's like, you know, if any of you got children, you'll know pretty quick. They have a choice to do something, the right thing or the wrong thing. None of us are going to have children where they just do the right thing all the time. You just can't help it. It's just a natural thing. In fact, it's the opposite. <laughs> they have to learn to do the right thing. But this power of free will is a gift that he gave us. He didn't make us like robots. He made us with this free will. And with free will, there comes accountability. Because it means, and that's why we're made in the image of God, because this accountability means that, yeah, you, mankind, you can make your choice. You can choose to accept Jesus as your savior and say he's the truth, or you can be your own truth. You can be your own savior. In, in fact, you can be your own God in life. And that's what a lot of people do, is like, you know, I, I'm the God of my life, and I'll decide, and no one tells me, what, and if I feel like I want to do it, I'm going to do it. Or we come and we say, do you know what, I believe that there is a Savior, that I need a Savior, and his name is Jesus. So you've got this powerful free will to choose what God has asked us to do, or to do our own thing. And that's where we get the idea of selfishness from. So God has given us this great gift and for every one of us even as I bring this message comes with it is this thing called regret where we sort of have this like great um, gift to be able to choose but within choosing we don't always get it right and with it we carry through life and I meet people all the time people uh, use terms like they've got a chip on their shoulder Maybe they're carrying some sort of resentment. Maybe there's regret in their life. And their life is marked by more the failure rather than the hope. And this is what Jesus does. is He steps in and he steps in and he says, yeah, do you know what? If, because I've given you this gift and because you are in a way separate from me, until you come to me, you're going to find that that's going to be a struggle. And so with it, he comes in and he says, no, I can turn the failure into hope. And so this is, this is what he does. This is who he is. But the trouble is, when we live our own way, there is always loss. And as we've journeyed through this last few weeks, there's always loss. Because if we do our own thing and we follow our own desires, I know for sure, I'm stood up here saying, my own desires that are against God resulted in loss. But there's this powerful thing about hope. It has this redeeming value. Redeeming value and all about the gospel is something that was lost can actually be pulled back, can actually be taken again and said, you know, that which was lost has been found. And this is what the gospel is about. It's like we, we're all here owning up, you know, as every born again believer I know, every one of us, the fact that we are born again is because we came to a point of realizing I am lost without a savior. There's nothing I can do to achieve that salvation, to be saved in my soul. I, I can't do anything. But through this grace, through Jesus, through the cross, I have chance to be redeemed. So I was lost, but now I'm found. I was lost, but now I have hope. And that's the powerful thing of the gospel. See, grace is God's intervention in our lives. It's undeserved. We don't deserve it. But there's this powerful thing that steps into our life. And I believe even today, the grace of God is speaking into situations where there is perhaps failure, where there is regret, where there is hurt, where there's been loss, where somehow death took a hold of our life. 
And in a way, there's hopelessness, but he redeems, you see, and he steps in and says, no, I'm going to bring hope. This is what I love about him. Everything about Jesus, when he's here, what is he doing? He's stepping into people's lives like the prostitute who everyone wants to stone. The religious people want to stone her, but he comes in and he says, oh, I haven't come to condemn you. What have I done? I've come to redeem you. I haven't come to look at your sin and look at what you're marked by. I've come to redeem you. I've come to save you. And there is like, like this redeeming power and it's called grace. Even Peter, who's one of the disciples, he gets it wrong. And at the end, he sort of denies Jesus. And then Jesus steps in again and he says, I know you're marked right now by your failure. There's regret. But I'm going to step in and I'm going to come and say, no, you can come to me. Do you love me? He says, he says, yeah, I do love you. He says, well, come back home then. See, and he's redeeming him. He's redeeming the call. And Peter steps in. So today, Christ wants to redeem. No matter where you've journeyed the last few weeks, I want, want us to like leave with this message at the end of saying there, there is redemption power. So even if there's confusion or loss, mistakes, something that is somehow, the, the pain of that is still, do you know what? Jesus, through the gospel, has this redeeming power that is supernatural. It won't be, what I'm going to share with you is it's not like an intellectual argument. It's not going to be trying to convince you that Jesus is the one. I'm going to share with you the power of grace, that is God's love through the gospel, that he comes to redeem you. And if only you would just open your heart, he's going to touch your heart today. He's going to touch your heart. Where there is like a desert, he's going to come and bring life. There's going to come life through this message because this is the message of the gospel. This is what he does. This powerful uh, image of who God is, right back, uh, just just have Garden of Eden and then Adam and Eve, they have Cain and Abel. Yeah, these two brothers. And we know Cain ends up killing, I mean, straight away, free will, free choice. Here he is. He, he gets angry, the rest of it, and he takes his brother's life. But the bit I want to just show you is that straight after, in Genesis 4, you will see that Eve, who is called the mother of living, she ends up having a third child, and they call him Seth. And Seth means the appointed one, the substitute of God's favor. And Eve believed with all her heart that this compensation was the compensation for the son that had been murdered. You've got to understand this. This is the redeeming power right here. See, there is loss. Let's leave it to mankind. Loss, murder, hatred. This is, this is where the selfishness comes in. Then God steps in. See, he doesn't have to. He steps in. He says, right, I'm going to give you another son, Seth. He's going to be the appointed, the anointed substitute. But he's not just talking about Seth. He's given us an idea at the beginning of Genesis of Jesus. Because Jesus, you see, even when mankind got it wrong in the garden and there was a separation between us and God and, and rejection because we chose to disobey God and walk away from him, already Jesus was on the bench of the substitutes waiting to step into the world stage to say, actually, I'm going to fill the gap. I'm going to step in. I'm going to create a bridge of hope, a bridge of hope that won't just be your good works. It won't just be your religion. It won't just be your sort of, I don't know, self-help books. It's going to be the fact that it's a person and his name is Jesus. And so he's on the, he's sort of in heaven at the right hand of the Father waiting, saying, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. Bring me on the field. Bring me on the field ready. You know, we might be 10 nil down. We might be sort of down, on, you know, in the world's eyes, but I'm, I'm coming. I'm coming ready to strike. I'm coming ready. And it even says and refers, doesn't it, that, you know, that, that one, you know, he the enemy is going to bruise his heel, but he will come and crush the head of the enemy. He's talking about Jesus. See, the substitute already has been talked about. And right through Scripture, you will see God's redemption plan is when there's been loss in your life, God already has a substitute. When there is lack right now, God has a substitute. When life was taken away from you, there is already a substitute. God has this. Why does he do that? Because God has this big agenda that he wants to see his promises fulfilled in your life and when it's hijacked because it says the enemy is the robber and thief for some of us we've been blaming God for too long for why did that happen why let that it says the enemy is a robber and thief and even when the enemy came in maybe even through our poor decisions foolish choices 
God's just got this grace thing going on of redemption that steps in and says, okay, that was a bad decision. I, I want to testify to this. The amount of times I made a stupid decision and then he just like steps in some time after. It's like, no, you call me Lord. You follow me. Even in your decisions, I'm going to lead you through because I have a substitute for you. Because what does it say? We as earthly fathers, as parents, how much we want to give good gifts to our children. How much more does our Father in heaven? See, he's, the, he's this king of substitutes. See, he's there saying, no, I've already got a substitute. And some of you need to hear this message today because you gave up hope because you didn't realize there's a substitute plan that God has. And he's saying, come on after me because there is a substitute. Redemption, this is how it works. When Jesus comes, he's the substitute for our sin. When he comes on the cross and he gives his life for us, he, he, he spills his blood for us. What is it? It's the substitute. It's, it's not us. It should be us, but it's him. Can you see that? It runs right through the gospel. Now, many years ago, guys, I got a bit of a confession. When I was sort of, you know, young, pastoring, uh, and we were trying to work and we were trying to build the church, I had to start some businesses to try and make a living. One of them was a pet shop. But it was exotic pets. And, uh, you know, like tarantulas and snakes and those things. So anyway, we had lots of those things come back home at times. And, um, and, it, and it, we lost some of them in the home. But it was like just amazing. But I just want to tell you a story. It was called Dr. Doolittles. I thought it was a great name. And, uh, and I had this, the most expensive pet I, I bought for the pet shop was called Benji the Parrot. He was an African silver grey. Um, and he was, don't worry, he was registered. He was like ca captive bred in this country and, and everything else. And, and I had him, not in a cage, he sat on a perch in my, sh in my shop area. So he talked to people. And people would come in and out of the door and he was right by the door. And he was there sort of, you know, just looking at freedom through the door every time it opened. 200 times a day, but he just sat there, ate his peanuts. Chatted to me, saying, you're a pretty boy. I you, and uh, and it, was, it was like, uh, I thought, what can you teach him? I thought it was a good thing. Made me feel good every day. And, and so what happened was is he'd been there for a good year or so because I kept him in, in the shop. But he was worth a lot of money. And I clipped his wing. Again, didn't, didn't hurt the animal. Just you cut the flight feathers. And it means when he takes off, he goes lopsided and crashes. It means he can't really go far. Yeah. So it means he, if he flies out, I'll be able to catch him. This one day, he decides it is the great escape day. <laughs> Someone cut, and I don't know what got into his mind. It was like freedom. The, the, like the redeemer was there for him. And he jumps out, and he sort of can't get a lot of sort of flight. So he gets out and sort of manages to get out through the door and crash lands outside. So I quickly come around from where the, the counter is, come outside and there's different buildings and a car park, it's in the town. And I come out, the bird has vanished. He cannot fly, he has to walk everywhere. He can't really fly, but he's vanished, he's not there. I mean, it's not often in Hereford in England you see an African grey <laughs> parrot with a red tail walking around town, but he's gone. And I searched because it was like all I saw were just these pound notes, you know. It was like, where's that thousand pounds gone? Where is he? And it, for us, when you're building, this, this was like it, devastating. Yeah. Spent an hour looking everywhere through the car park search party. Couldn't find it. Went home that night. Told H, sorry, it's going to take us probably like three months to pay this off. So, so I went and said, oh, I don't know, what, you know, just nothing I can do. It's gone, vanished. Perhaps someone stole him, kidnapped him. I don't know. Then in the morning, something really strange happened. In the morning, early, someone was knocking on our door. Now, we lived 15 miles away, about half an hour away from the shop. So a long way away, knock on the door. And this woman said, do you own a parrot? <laughs> now, I, I was pretty amazed. I said, well, yeah, I do, but why are you asking? Because this was like yesterday, half an hour away, parrot's gone. She said, there is a parrot in your hedge. <laughs> so I went out, it was Benji. <laughs> so me and him got reconciled. I was so pleased. I looked and I was just baffled. I was thinking, 
how did my parrot, and I travelled 36 miles the night before because I went to another town to a customer and all this, and I was baffled. I was just thinking, how did he get... Then I saw on his tail some oil. Do you know what he did? He walked into the car park with loads of cars. He chose my car. It was sort of... It had paintwork like a zebra. <laughs> but he chose my car. And he climbed up in the engine compartment and travelled 36 miles, slept there the night, popped out in the morning and said, I'm back. <laughs> and the reason I'm sharing this story with you <laughs> is because I remember the moment <laughs> when something I thought was completely lost was found. And if you've ever lost something, you think, I'll never, ever see that again. I, I know it was a bird, but it was our livelihood. It was like a big impact, would have been a big impact on our family, etc. cetera. And, and there was just something profound about what I thought was lost was actually there all the time. What you thought had been lost, through the power of the gospel, I can say this. Again, not a self-help sort of... These are some clever principles. No, it's through this power of the gospel because everything about the gospel is redeeming. In fact, it's redemption central. You want to take something that was lost and you want to retrieve it. This is what God does. It's like it's what he said. It's just in his nature and who he is. And that might have been a parrot, but I know for many of us, that's the story of our lives. That's a story where we somehow got lost. We didn't intend on getting lost, but we had a chance for a bit of freedom, flew through the door, and then we thought, how are we going to get home again? But today is the day you can come home because some of you flew into some freedom and found the freedom wasn't what you thought. It was dirty and filthy and dark. And it was like, how do I get back? But today, this power of the gospel of redemption is calling you back and it's saying there is a way back. There's nothing more beautiful than when you think something's been lost. Someone has been lost. And then they're found. Romans 3 verse 23 to 25. It says, for we've all sinned. All of us. None of us have the right to come and say, I deserve this. We've all sinned. Whether we fulfilled the law in all its ways, but stumble on one thing, it says, sorry, you fail in everything. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and all justified freely by his grace. Not by works, not by religion, not by your status, but by this power of redeeming grace. See, it says it here, by his grace through the redemption that came by who? Jesus Christ. He was the one. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. He corrected something that we did wrong. He paid a price. We became bankrupt. He didn't just pay the debt, but he put us in credit. Grace. He gave us a hope where there was no hope. A future where we couldn't see a way forward. And this whole gospel, that's why this is alive. God presented Christ as a sacrifice for this atonement through the shedding of his blood. And how do we receive it? It's by faith. And today, you've got an opportunity, if you do not know Jesus as your Savior, if maybe you've been on this journey with us and you've been searching for, what is my true identity? What's my purpose? What, you know, what, what about this whole area of gender and all these? I want to point you to Jesus and say that we have, do you know what? We are all in the same boat. <laughs> Every person on this earth, there is no one, no one, it doesn't matter whether they get called a saint or whatever, sorry, we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're all at this place before the cross, which is level ground. And it's so important. This is what we've been impressing home church. You know, we've shared what the Bible says about our identity and all these different areas, but God, it's we got to ground this in the basis that God loves you and it's level ground. None of us have a higher status than anyone else. We all, I think that, that's the greatest thing that impacts me is I know how broken I am as a human being, but I know the power of the Redeemer that put me together. I don't need to be told how broken I am. But the more I'm aware of my brokenness, the more 
I chase and pursue Jesus. So if you come and follow Jesus, and some of you chose to follow him, made a decision, I made him my savior, but you weren't really aware of your brother. It was like, yeah, you know, I think it's going to perhaps, Jesus is going to help me, and I, you know, I'm a little bit aware of that. But if you're not aware of your true brokenness, you're not really going to run after him and pursue him. So I want to share this, this story. This is our main story for today. Luke 7, verse 36, 39. It is, it is an incredible story that impacts me ever since I got saved. I always looked at this story. It just touches my heart. Yet it's about a woman. She, became this, this, she becomes famous through this story. See, Jesus has a revolution on the value system of the day. What we place as, oh, that's important, status is important, and if you're religious, and if you're, got, if you're knowledgeable, and if you've got this and that, and, and there is this thing even now in our world that does that, whereas Jesus comes and he says, oh, no, my value system is completely different. So here we pick it up. Uh, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house, reclined at the table. They wanted to debate with him. But then a woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. You don't go to the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume, very expensive. As she stood behind him, at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet uh, with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. And when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man was a real prophet, if he was really sort of godly and holy, he'd know the sort of woman, this prostitute that is touching him, what kind of woman she is, this sinner. I love, guys, let's just stop then, right? I just love this story. So you got the picture. You got the religious, te- now the, these Pharisees, I think they have, is it 613 laws they have to follow? Interesting thing, there's more negative laws than positive laws, which says a bit about them. And they're they're trying to trap Jesus all the time. You didn't do this, so you failed. You got this wrong. And there were like things about what you should eat, what you shouldn't eat, uh, certain times of the day you shouldn't travel, uh, because then, you know, that's like wrong. And through it, they've got all these customs that they're busy trying to follow. And they want Jesus, they invite Jesus to come and have a debate with him. Because religion wants to debate with you, whilst Jesus wants to bring redemption to you. And so he goes along, but I think it's for the benefit of the woman, not the guys. And so there they want to debate with him, and then up pops this woman into the room. Can you imagine? They're all sat around. And then this woman, she comes into the room. Now, she is known... And I'm putting to you, of the, the way they're talking about her, that her lifestyle would have been a, a prostitution. But she's heard about this Jesus. She's heard. Now, this woman has been through so much. She has been used and abused by men. She went through some tragic things as a young person. No one knows this, but right now she sort of is shunned and people look at her and there's shame over her. But she steps into the some of the most religious leaders of the day, with Jesus, who is the Christ in the middle. She bursts into the room, and she's not allowed. She hasn't got permission, but she's got a conviction that this is the one. This is her chance to come through. Maybe this is your chance today. Maybe this is your chance. It's like the door is slightly open, and Jesus is here, and he said, will you come through? I'll tell you, there's no one here that's going to condemn you. There is something something powerful about saying, come on, he's, he's waiting for you. He's waiting for you. He planned to be there for this woman she found out about it and she bursts in do you know what her hair is down she's got long hair not allowed she's she's covered in tattoos she's got jewelry and piercings where you shouldn't have piercings back in those days right it was like she's there she's even got sexual disease that she's carrying and some of us are like Ooh. but didn't Jesus come to take our diseases And he took him on the cross. And I'm not talking about just physical disease. I'm talking about the biggest disease of our sin and rebellion against God our Father. He came and he says, I'm going to break this thing. I'm going to break this. You come to me. And she turns up and she throws herself down. And she starts weeping 
before Jesus. I think this is audacious. I think this woman, she's got the top award for bravery. She's in there before the scowls and they're murmuring to each other. And they're stepping back because they might get infected by her. Because you can't even touch someone's garment if she's been doing what she's doing. Because it will actually make you unclean. And then Jesus steps forward. <laughs> and Jesus comes forward. And you've got to understand this. No matter where you are and where you've traveled, where you've been. He's not interested in your past. He's interested right now in what you will do. And he's coming. Jesus is saying, oh, tell me about your history. Tell me like, oh, what you, what's, what's your challenges? He comes and he's just there and, and, and forgiveness flows over her life. She looks at him and she says, this is the one from heaven. Do you know what? There is grace and redemption here. She's, ta she's tapping into the power of redemption. He's right there and that's why she anoints him and she starts like crying because she's overwhelmed with praise. Because when you truly find the Savior, your heart's overwhelmed with praise. It's not like, oh, this, this thing of following Jesus is hard work, people. Do we have to follow him again on Monday morning? Do I have to make that decision that of holiness instead of doing what I want to do? And yet, when you come and you realize, see, she, she found her brokenness. She knew, I've got nothing left to offer, but he has everything to offer me, and he's calling me. And this exchange, this divine exchange that's going on, see, a dam breaks in her soul, and it pours out through her eyes. And it's like this love and affection for the Savior, the one who's come. He's come exactly for her. He's come for her. And she's there. This wasn't a mistake. It wasn't an accident. He planned to be there for her. He planned to be here today for you. In fact, there's been many times some of you have encountered and touched Jesus very, almost very close, but you decided to carry on walking. And today, I'm pleading with you to say, will today be the day that you look and say, I need that Savior, I need a Savior? No matter where you're standing right now about who you are and I don't know what, what that looks like, come to the one who is the Redeemer. Come to the one who is called Grace. As he steps forward, she found a savior. And it's like, I believe that she's there thinking, Jesus, I found someone who really knows the real me. Not by what I've done, by my history, but he's looking right into my soul and he knows who I really am. He knows who you really are. He knows you and he's stepping in. And it's like, come on, amongst all that pain and the scars, he steps in and values her. He says, come on, you're part of my kingdom. And we know that that changes everything. It doesn't just stop there. You know, many uh, scholars believe that obviously she then ends up becoming part of the followers and she's sort of around some of the resurrection and stuff like that. She, her moment changes, but it had to be a moment. And I want us to t take us a little bit further from here because in Hebrews 6 verse 19, we need this hope, guys. And it says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul. When everything looks like there's a storm, who is the hope? It's Jesus, this hope. It actually says he's the one that went for us. Firm and secure is this anchor. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where we could not go before Jesus went for us so that we could be redeemed through his blood. That's what he's doing with her. He's redeeming her. He's calling out and he's saying, do you know what? Perfect love has no fear. That's why she walks into the room. It was like you could cut the atmosphere with a knife because perfect love stands behind, right in front of her. And she's coming and she's like just meets it. And the fear, she's lived a life in fear, but right now it's just diminishing. It's running because perfect love stands in front of you. And no matter, you might say, I've heard people say all the time, you wouldn't want me to come to, to your church. Because, you know, I, it's not just that I'm not a Christian. In fact, some of these people believe God is real, but they said, you know, if I step in, I'm going to get burnt up. <laughs> or, you know, if, if I come to your, you wouldn't want my sort. Or, you know, sorry, but there's so much hatred in me through what I've been through. You wouldn't want me. I said, you know what? You're exactly who, you, who we want. You're exactly, you know I, I, you know, I just don't know where I'm going, what I'm doing. You're exactly, exactly who Jesus wants. See, when you're at the moment, this, this is the thing, when you're at the moment of desperation, yeah. you do realize your brokenness and you need for a savior. Yeah. 
when we've actually got it quite all together and we think we're pretty good, we're in danger of being self-righteous and that's when you don't really encounter redemption to its fullness. Because it's like, well, you know. So Jesus has this way of taking complete brokenness and making it into purpose, into power, love with no fear. Come to me. She must have had questions. She just came to him. Come to him. Saved by grace, you see. But we've got to understand as well, she wasn't just saved. It was like, hey, great, you know, thanks for the anointing. Off you go and carry on with your lifestyle. We know that the encounter with Jesus and her brokenness leads to a whole new life where she turns around and and the Bible really calls this repentance, where she changes her mind and she turns around and she faces towards you and she follows him, follows him. You can't just come and say, here's all my brokenness and my rubbish and baggage. I want some hope. I want some hope around my identity. I want some hope around my sexuality. I want some hope here. This this is what I'm saying. You, You need to come, regardless of the questions, And you look and say, do you know what? I need a savior. I need you, Jesus. And actually, my identity and who I am is all wrapped up in who Jesus is. I found it to be true. But I'm going to have to stop practicing some of the things I've practiced to walk into what God... This, This goes for every one of us, whether that is my lying, my cheating whether it's my adultery, whether it's my greed. But guys, it's, it's like everything. This is about holiness. We've said it from the start. This whole series as humans is about us becoming more like Christ. Holiness is something we walk towards as we see Jesus. When I recognize my brokenness, I walk more towards his holiness and who he is to become like him. See, we're no longer who we were. We're new creations. You are a new creation. And that, that's why I'm excited to share this last uh, this last scripture here from Titus 2, verse 11 to 14. It says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. So you think, oh, it's not for me, or I've gone too far. Here it is. The grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people, not some, all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness. Oh, and worldly passions. So some of you might think, do you know what? I, I'm just, I can't control my worldly passions. I can't say no. Scripture says different. It says, through the grace of God and the power of redemption, when you are saved, you see, you're no longer a slave to sin, but there is life in the spirit. And so, that, see, the enemy will spend all day accusing you, saying, oh, yeah, but you're different. You failed. You did this. You're marked. That memory, I'm going to keep reminding you. I'm going to keep bringing back those horrible images. I'm going to keep bringing back that sort of time that you were mistreated. And yet here, Jesus is saying, come on, I'm redeeming. You actually have, through Scripture, through the Gospel, through the truth, who is Jesus, the power to say no to ungodliness and to live a self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus, he's coming back, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness. So we're not just, I don't know, half price, buy one, get one free. We were redeemed. You were not faulty. You were redeemed. You were not made it only halfway and other people made it all the way. His blood for you at the cross because it's level ground is equal to everyone that calls upon that name, that name of Jesus. And here it is. And he's saying, there it is. For everyone. Here it is. He gave himself to redeem us from all wickedness, to purify for himself a people that are his own, his very own, eager to follow him and do what is good. This is the power, the gospel, that turns us turns us into a promise-keeping people, a legacy-fulfilling nation that will pursue 
that which was lost because everything about him will redeem. Even now, some of you have given up on some promises that you once had, some dreams that you had and you thought, you know what, I think that's over now because of the mistakes or the mistakes of others. And I believe that today God has said, no, no, there's, there's power of redemption in this message. There's redeeming power through this gospel, through the one who is called Jesus. And some of us need to rekindle faith again and say, power, this is redemption central. Every time you touch this name and you use Jesus on your lips and you praise him, there's power of redemption within your lips. But the enemy doesn't want you to believe it because when you believe it, he's in trouble. When you start redeeming these things, he's in trouble. There's legacy that I'm speaking into. Unborn children, there are even children in the children right now through this word of redemption that's coming. It looked like the enemy had it wrapped up, but right now, <laughs> even through the power of this God, if, if you... Go through the door. The door's open. Maybe you're fearful. Can I trust him? Will he let me down? No, she locks eyes with him. She bursts through. <laughs> she didn't see anyone else. She just sees Jesus, the Savior. See, since the garden, and I mentioned this in week one, we as mankind have, we've just craved acceptance. And through history, we have tried all sorts of ways to find acceptance through various forms of what people would call love or experience. Because what's within us, we're trying to find our way back to God. You're craving to find that love. You're craving to find an answer to rejection that is really the root. Is all because you need to come to the Father who is the only one that brings unconditional love to your life. See, he is the source. Because of Jesus, it makes it possible for every person to believe because of what he did on that cross. He came in, it's like unconditional love. You can't earn it. Nothing to do with your background, where you've come from, what you've done. It's unconditional love that is given. And as you come, he says, come. I make, you know, make Jesus your savior today. But you've got to know when, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond. But when you respond, there is something about, I'm going to sin no more. Now, you're going to get things wrong. He's not talking about that. He's saying, no, turn around from the lifestyle and you being the boss, you being the God of your life, turn around and make Jesus the Lord of your life. And start saying, Jesus, whatever you ask, I'm coming after you. Whatever you ask, I'm coming for you. Teach me, show me. And it says here in Titus that there is the power to purify your life through the power of his blood, through the redeeming power of the gospel. Yes. Not because of ourselves, but all because of him. This unconditional love. What a way to finish up. This unconditional love. Guys, I don't deserve it. You know, there, there are days when I, I fail and I think, oh, I should have learned that one. Messed up again. And beat, you know, you beat yourself up. And he's there saying, come on. Come on. Forgiveness is there. Come on, I'm doing a work in you. Keep coming after me. Don't be discouraged today. Come after me. This is the power of this gospel. So guys, I want to give an opportunity right now in our locations around the world, in Hereford here. I believe that there are some people that have come in that do not know Jesus as their savior. Maybe you've been tracking us through this series. And I just wanna point you right back to the one who is your father, right? The father who gave his son for you, that whoever would believe. And you are that person, that individual now. There is salvation as you come and you discover who I really am. I'm a child of God. And that I can come to my Father through what Jesus did. That today, Jesus, this Redeemer, He's calling us. He's saying, come on home. Come on home. Come through the door. Break through the door. Even now, you're maybe thinking of, oh, what, what's my partner going to say? What's, what's my family going to say? My friends, what about some of the things I'm involved with? He's, she just came and burst through the door. <laughs> She came and got before his feet. And I'm telling you, when you encountered Jesus, what she was doing was getting in his presence just to be with him. So I'm saying, will you come and choose today? If you've never put your faith in Jesus before, will you come and say, I want to make you my savior. I'm sorry. I confess my sin to you and I make you my Lord. 
I'm going to follow you. And maybe I'm speaking also to some people that are far from God. You once knew him. Maybe you had an awareness of him in the past, but right now you're far away and he is here today with his arms open wide saying, come on home, come on home. He's ready and he's waiting. He said, come on home. The Redeemer is here. He wants to bring redemption into your life. But you can't do it sitting on the fence. You gotta jump in, trust him through faith. Through faith, there is salvation. So right now, can I ask everyone to close their eyes? And I'm just going to ask here, whoever today wants to put their faith in Jesus for the first time or return to him and recommit their life, will you just raise your hand? Because I want to be able to pray for you. Just want to raise your hand so I can see it. Then I'll ask you to put it down. I want to be able to pray for you. So wherever you are, whatever location, will you raise your hand and say, that's for me. I want to choose this Jesus today. I want to choose him. Will you raise your hand? I want to come home. I want to break through the door. I'm encouraging you now. This is the most important part. This is the decision. So one more time. Will you raise your hand and say, that's for me. I believe there's people struggling with this now, but he's here saying, come, come to me. Come to me right now. Then will you raise your hand and say, here I, here I am, here I am. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, Father, I thank you for the people that have made decisions to follow you today. I pray for every one of them right now that your love, oh, it would just overflow, that the dam would break in their soul. Oh God, that they would just know that you love them unconditionally as they're responding to you right now, coming home right now. Come on, that's it. I see people coming home, coming home. People choosing for the first time. There's a whole new legacy that's just started for you because you chose today. Do you know what? Children will be born because of this decision today. There is something that is happening because he's really redeeming he's pulling back that which was stolen and lost and he's coming right now and pouring forgiveness into your life he's coming redeeming he's coming and saying this is the hope of the gospel for you today in the name of Jesus just want to give you thanks Lord you're a great God I want to thank you Lord that you've been with us through this series Lord Father I want to thank you Lord that for every one of us that believe Lord that we <laughs> We have the privilege of coming before you. That you're the one that went for us. May we never take it for granted. We thank you that as the church, we carry the hope of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you guys. Thank you. What a word yeah. to finish up this human series. What an amazing series Absolutely. this has been, right church? I mean, I really want to thank Pastor G yeah. and the entire senior leadership team yes. for bringing us this series and what a gift it is for yeah. us as a movement. Absolutely. Church, we're so glad that you joined us this morning. Yeah. If you've responded or if you have any questions, anything about the series or about Jesus and yeah. you want to take your next step in yes. this journey, Come on. please reach out to us. Yeah. You can email us at hello at freedomchurch.cc That's right. or chat in the comments or send us a message through any social media platform yeah. and we'd love to get back in touch with you. That's great. So guys, see you all yeah. next week for our Easter event. Don't forget to invite your friends. Bye-bye. Yes.